Hi. Uh, last lecture, we stopped with the classification of uh, toxic agents. We understood that there is some uh, called toxins, while others are called, are called <clears throat> toxicin. And we gave some examples about some compounds that may appear like uh, um, a toxicants rather than uh, toxins, okay? So we'll start today <clears throat> to talk about the spectrum of the undesired effects. <clears throat> Starting with allergic reactions. So these are immunologically related reactions to a chemical resulting from previous exposure to that chemical or to a structure similar one. The hypersensitivity is most often used to describe this allergic state. While the idiosyncratic reactions is genetically determined abnormal uh, reactivity to a chemical. So the response actually is qualitatively similar to that observed in all individuals. So it's a kind like have the similar uh, um, uh, magnitude or effect among individuals. So what is immediate versus delayed toxicity? For the immediate toxic effect, those that develop, develop rapidly after a single administration of a substance, while the delayed, those that occur after uh, some time. Allergic reactions will idiosyncratic reactions No, it's different because for the second one, the, uh, it's genetically determined. So the individual is already born with uh, this uh, kind of reaction, uh, this kind of uh, sensitivity to the compound. But in the first case, <clears throat> it's not genetically in his genes. And due to <clears throat> a number of reactions, uh, the individual become uh, sensitive to that chemical, okay? Or a similar structure. Uh, okay, and in the أول واحدة هي عم تكون مكتسبة مع الرياكشنز اللي عم تصير معه بحياته يعني. أوكي ثانك يو. So what's the reversible versus irreversible toxic reactions or toxic effects? So if a chemical produces a pathological injury to the tissue, the ability of that tissue to regenerate determines whether the effect is reversible or irreversible. Let's see some examples. For the liver, for example, the liver, our liver have a very high ability to regenerate. So most injuries to that tissue is reversible because the liver can regenerate. While for the central nervous system, it is largely irreversible. And that's obvious because cells of the central nervous system cannot divide. You are born, you all, we all are born with a definite set of number, definite number of nerve cells that we never divide after our goal. So, and generally, carcinogenic and the teratogenic effects of chemicals are usually consider considered irreversible toxic effects. So what's local versus systemic toxicity? Of course, as the name implies, local, that means that occur at the site of the first exposure, first contact between the biological system and the toxicant. While for the systemic effect, it requires that the toxicant had to be absorbed and distributed from its entry point to a distant site at which the effects are being produced. So let's talk about the route of it and the site of exposure as a characteristic. There are major routes, actually. The major routes by which the toxic agents can access to the body are either gastrointestinal tract by ingestion, lungs by, by inhalation, skin, either topical or percutaneous or dermal, and other, other intestinal canal like perineum and uh, routes. So toxic agents generally produce the greatest effect and the most rapid response when given directly into the blood stream. So you can see here a descending order of the effectiveness of routes would be inhalation is the most severe, intraproteinal followed by intraproteinal, followed by intramuscular, followed by intradermal, oral, and dermal. 
Okay, so the effective, effectiveness in the dermal, if it's given dormant, it is the lowest. What is a vehicle? The vehicle is the material in which the toxicant or the chemical is dissolved. And this vehicle can markedly uh, alter absorption after ingestion, inhalation, or topical exposure. So the route of administration actually can influence the toxicity of agents. Example of that, we'll see that agent, any agent that can act on the central nervous system, but efficiently detoxified, detoxify, detoxified in the liver, can be detoxified in the liver, is less toxic when given orally than when given by inhalation. And this is very obvious because the oral route for these toxicants will have to pass, so the, the chemical will have to pass through the liver. And the main function of the liver in our body is detoxification. So when it reaches the system, uh, systemic circulation, and this, then the center nervous system, the effect of this agent will be minimum and less toxic due to uh, administration by oral. But if its administration was inhalation, it will affect straight away the central nervous system. So for the vehicle, I can highlight some point because normally it is not recommended. So normally we take bills of drugs, uh, the bills, tab tablets with water to have our medication. So normally it's not re recommended to take any medication Generally, it's not recommended to take any medication with other uh, solvent other than water. You can see some uh, patients take medication with milk, with uh, fizzy drink, with uh, juices, but it's always better to take with water because the vehicle here, the juice or the milk, may change the uh, rate of absorption in the gastrointestinal tract and may affect the release of the active gradient of the medication. Any questions? No, it's clear. Okay. So let's uh, see here. This is like a, 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 schemat, a schematic drawing uh, figure of the uh, mo, uh, of the routes, either inhalation, ingestion, or even direct contact. So the occupational exposure, that's mean if you if someone uh, got exposed uh, at, at the location of his uh, work to toxic agents, may result frequently from breathing contaminated air by inhalation or by direct contact of the skin to the substance, and that's dermal exposure. Whereas accidental and suicidal poisoning occurs most frequently by oral ingestion. The comparison of the lethal dose of a toxic substance by different routes of exposure often provide useful information about the extent of absorption, how much it is absorbed. So when a toxic dose after oral or dermal administration is similar to toxic dose after intravenous administration, that means this toxic agent is absorbed very rapidly. Because as we agree from the last few slides, that the intravenous, this means blood administration, have the highest effect in reaching the toxic dose. So if we have a medication or, or a chemical compound or an agent, that we found that it is the same toxic dose can be reached in the same time, even by oral dermal or intravenous. That means that this toxic agent via the oral route is very absorbed, is absorbed rapidly. Conversely, when the toxic dose by dermal route is much higher than the oral dose, that means that the skin can provide an effective barrier to the absorption of the agent. So toxicologists usually divide the exposure of experimental animals to chemical into four categories either acute, subacute, subchronic, or chronic. For the acute exposure, that's mean that the animal is 
uh, is exposed single one time, one time exposure to a chemical for a period that is less than 24 hours. So what about the repeated exposure? It's, it falls under the subacute, subchronic, and chronic. For the subacute exposure, it is not single exposure. It is repeated exposure to a chemical for one month or less. For the subchronic exposure, as well, it is repeat, repeated exposure, but for one to three months. For the chronic, it is repeated exposure to a chemical or an agent or a toxicant for more than three months. So you can see here, ingestion of a toxin lead to the mouse GI tract, and then the rest of it goes to the feces, while inhalation go directly to the nose and mouth, then to the liver, in which, it, uh, sorry, to the lungs, in which it can go straight away to the blood. You can see that if it's, if it's absorbed through skin, you have a two, uh, two routes, either go through the blood or go through the fats and hence to the sweat memory glands or ca you can, you can uh, found the traces of that in the sweat, milk, tears, saliva, mean, mainly uh, all the biological fluids. It can reach through blood to the liver as well and the kidney and the can, can be detected in the urine. So this uh, figure shows the route of the agents or the toxicants or any chemical. So let's see here a, a very good example of how the relationship between the dose and the concentration at the target site under different condition of frequency and elimination rate. Let's clarify this figure first. So you have here three compounds a, B, and C. And you can see on the y-axis, it is the concentration at the target site um, versus the time. So for, for a chemical A, it, this chemical shows, okay, you measure, here you measure the concentration of chemical A at the target site. You can see that the chemical A has a very low, a very slow elimination. Elimination, that means it's, it's a concentration remains at, at the target site and it is not affected over time. While for chemical D, you can see that the rate of elimination is nearly equal to the fre frequency of dosing because it is decreased over time. What about C? C, that means that its rate of elimin elimination is very fast than the dosing frequency. That means uh, as long as you do dosing, it is the, the compound has been uh, degraded or uh, excreted or detoxified, okay? So what about the blue uh, shaded region here? Actually, the blue shaded region area represented the concentration of the chemical at the target site necessary to form an effect or a toxic response. So this is the minimum value and this is the maximum value for a single dose for compound A or B or C. So that means here, for compound, compound A, it retains its concentration and they have toxic response. While compound B, at a certain point, it is degraded and doesn't uh, uh, revoke any toxic response. While for, for compound C, it's a very fastly, fastly eliminated from the target site and hence we can't see any effect on the target side. Okay, so this figure shows a single dose administration of the three different compounds with three different elimination rates over time. So what happens if, if we, we, we try to do like successive doses for the same compounds? You can see here how these change. Keep in mind that the box in blue shows the minimum and the maximum concentration needed to uh, uh, provoke a toxic response. So a chemical that produces severe effect with a single dose, with a single dose, may have no effect at all if the dose is given um, on several intervals, okay? So you can see here, for B, for example, for B, 
for a certain amount of time, it can have an effect until it is the, uh, it, its concentration fail, fall, fails to reach the, up, uh, the range of uh, the toxic response. But here, for B, if it's taken on several intervals, you can see these are the times of the dose administration. You can see you need at least the, at the fifth dose to have an effect for uh, drug B. For C, you never see an effect because it's a, 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 a fast, rapidly uh, eliminated. For A, although a single dose showed the effect, but you need at least until the third uh, uh, repeated dose to, to see uh, the beginning of the effect of the drug A. So after one dose, the toxic concentration is reached. For A, of course, as we said, you need to wait until the third dose. One, two, one, two, three. At the third dose, start to have the, uh, uh, the amount, the concentration needed for the range of the uh, effect of this uh, chemical. For compound B, a toxic concentration is reached after the fifth dose. One, two, three, four, five, after the fifth dose. For C, you never see a, a, a toxic response. This toxic concentration will never be reached regardless of how many doses are, are being administered. Yani, Dr. Toxic and A, who actor she mummy, but we may be a strong, maybe I'm she toxicity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, in this figure, as a summary, it shows how the uh, repeated dosage can affect the availability or the concentration of the toxic agents inside the uh, target site. And sometimes you need a more repeated doses of the same chemical, which when administrated singly, it can uh, provoke an effect. You need a number of repeated doses to have the same effect. So what about the dose relation, uh, the dose response relationship? So it is a correlation relationship between the characteristics of the exposure and the spectrum of the toxic effect. So actually there are two types of dose response re re relationship. It is the individual dose response relationship, individual. That means the response of only one individual to a varying dosing, dosage of a chemical. And this often uh, <clears throat> referred to as a graded response because it's increasing or decreasing, whatever, but it's still graded response because the measured effect is continuous over range of doses. And as you can see for the figure, two compounds, which is the choline esterase and the carboxyliftrase, when increasing dosage, you have the percent of inhibition uh, because they inhibit uh, uh, a certain function. So with increasing dosage, you can see increasing in the percent of inhibition. And this is, is related to only one individual, okay? And this uh, explains what's individual dose, dose response relationship, graded, okay? For simplicity, normally they don't represent the graph in this form. They do something, so they convert the doses to the log 10 base, so to have it like fitting line as a straight line of data, usually drawn. So this is how you can represent the data of the individual dose response relationship. And this is the first type of dose response relationship. What about if you need to, to compare the individual response to different doses in a population of individual organisms, okay? So you need to see that the quantal dose response relationship, which characterizes the distribution of the individual responses to different doses in a population of individual organisms. 
So in this case, a widely used statistical approach for estimating response of, of a population, not an individual now, to a toxic exposure is called effective dose or ED. Usually we denote, denote it or, uh, or uh, refer it as a 50% response level. So we wrote it down, we write it down ED50 value. So the ED50 value, it is the effective dose needed to have an effect of the compound or the chemical. So if the death is measured as the end point, ED is referred to LD50, and now it's called lethal dose. That, that is responsible to, so for LD50, it is the lethal dose that uh, responsible for killing 50% or 50% of the total individual in the population for the LD50. So you can see because the quantal dose response phenomena are usually normally distributed, one can convert the percent of, uh, of uh, exposure to units and the division from the mean. Okay, before that, let's see how this quantal dose response is uh, relationship is represented. You can see here on the x axis, for example, you can uh, see the dosage or even another parameter, ages, age. And you can see the response or frequency or the, um, uh, the action can you can represent it on the y axis. So you can see that because you are testing over a population, you will always see. Uh, uh, individuals that have low response, individuals that have a, a high response, and they are distribution, distributed according to a, a histogram in the form of uh, this uh, graph. But normally it's a bit uh, confusing in this way. So there is a, a, quite, a, a bit of trick is doing for the representation of the graph as follows. So thus, the mean of the response, which is 50% response, is uh, referred to zero. That's mean you have the 50% response, whatever the response uh, is zero. So units of the mean are converted by the addition of five. So now to avoid, to avoid the negative numbers. So these converted units are called the property units. So basically you converted the mean of the response of the individuals into number five, mean plus five. And in this case, this mean plus five is called the probit units. So when there is a 50% response becomes a property of five, which is the mean, the 50%. If this, if the reading is above that, so we have 50% uh, uh, percent plus one, this gives the probit of six. If it's lower minus one, this gives the probit of four. When you draw this using the property units, you can see the property units here, you will, you will get a straight line, which is much easier to explain the result. When increasing dosage, you have direct relationship correlated, correlated with the response. You can see here that you have two y axis actually, one for the property units and one for the property scale, the actual increase in number. So continuing about the dose response relationship. So it's a kind of essential nutrients. So like vitamins, for instance, if you take the doses, dosage of the vitamin, you need, you need to take a certain amount of dose to avoid being this vitamin is toxic or to avoid to be deficient in this vitamin. So you need to stay on a dose that keeps a region of homeostasis for the optimum response without reaching an adverse effect. So these dose, starting from here to here, minimum dose, maximum dose is needed to have this, and this is the maximum level of the threshold for adverse response. So if you got more dosage than the maximum boundary, you will fall into a, a response that above the threshold. And if you have a minimum dose for the same vitamin, for instance, you will go as well above and lead, may lead to death. Yes. 
the perfect example for this, something like a vitamin A or retinols. If you take more, a lot of vitamin A, a lot of vitamin A, there is some researches have been um, uh, uh, showed that the vitamin A can, the, the extreme dosage of it can lead to some, few, some forms of cancer. So the shape of the dose response relationship for a substance are required for normal physiological function and survival. So the shape is graded, as we said, and for an individual over the entire dose is actually has a U shape have a U shape with the region in the middle, which is the optimum for the chemical. So here you can see some examples of the LD50 of different compounds. You can see something like ethyl alcohol ethanol have a very huge lethal dose, while something like putinium toxin or tetradoxin for putinium, for example, you have 0.0001. So it traces can be lethal. For nicotine, it's one milligram per kilogram. That's mean until one milligram, it's the least LD50. You can, if, if it go above uh, that, it will lead to toxic intoxication of the blood and may lead to death. Even the sodium chloride, you know, the sodium chloride is the normal soul. If you exceed uh, these uh, dose, the LD50, it's a, uh, uh, <clears throat> it's very important to uh, to not exceed the recommended uh, dosage. So let's see <clears throat> what are the assumptions in using the dose re response relationship. The response is due to actually the chemical administrator. The, the magnitude of the response is related to the dose. So it is a composite of three other assumptions. Actually, the magnitude of the response is related of, to the dose. It's a, a, a three assumption lead to this uh, as, main assumption. The molecular target sites or sites that the chemical will interact to initiate the response, as well the production of the response and the degree of the response are related to the concentration of the availability of this chemical at the target site. While the concentration at the site is actually, as we said before, is related to how the dose was administrated. For the third major assumption, there is a, always exist both quantifiable method for measuring and the precise means for expressing the toxicity. That's mean you need to have a way to measure quantitatively how the amount of this toxicity, the amount in numbers and the response as well. For example, a chemical that produces cancer through genotoxic effect, a chemical that produces cancer through genotoxic effect. For example, like ethidium bromide. Ethidium bromide is used normally in gel electrophoresis, which is forbidden now in almost all countries. This ethidium bromide can bind to DNA and cause a mutation or a genotoxic effect, which, which might lead to cancer. So any chemical compound that produce genotoxic effect or liver damage and central nervous system effects via different mechanisms. So you have the same compound that can affect three uh, targets, the central nervous system, the liver, and the and DNA. This, the, this same chemical may have three different dose response relationship, one for each endpoint. So let's see some good example here about how you can evaluate the dose response uh, relationship. And in this example, we are, we are evaluating the anesthesia, the amount of uh, uh, the, the dose responsible for doing uh, the anesthesia. So let's compare between three expressions now. The effective dose ED, the toxic dose TD, the lethal dose LD. 
So actually, what we are aiming to, to reach, which of those of these? Which, we, which those we are aiming to reach of these ones? The ED or TD or LD? Effective dose. Okay, so it's yeah, so it's the effective dose. So you can see the blot here. We have we have done it like profit unit, so actually it is a quantum and the and the percentage part. You can see with increasing dose, you reach first for the ED. When the dose increase, you reach to the toxic dose. When the dose is increased more, you reach to the lethal dose. Okay, so the blood here is a lock dosage versus percentage of the population responding in profit units. Let's go deeper and see how this will help us. It will help us to identify the therapeutic index. How much, how much, how amount I need as a therapeutic. So TI of a drug is an approach estimate about the relative safety margin of the drug expressed as the ratio of the toxic dose to the therapeutic dose. Let's see how it's calculated from the curve. So the TI is actually the toxic dose 50% over the ED50. So you can calculate TD50 and ED50 from the curve. From figure, you can approximate a therapeutic index. And of course, the larger the ratio, the greater the safety, because you are, you are dividing the toxic dose over the effective dose. So how we can calculate it? ED50, you can see that ED50 from the figure is around 20, while TD50 is around 60. So when you divide, you find the TI index, uh, a therapeutic index of three. So if you are comparing two kinds of drug that acting on the same target, and you find that one of them have a TI equal three, and one of them have a TI equal five, so which, which one of them is much better to use if they are the two, two different target, but uh, sorry, two different drugs, but act on the same target. So which of them will be more effective and safe? The index that has five. Of course. So in this slide, we describe how to have like a, a approximate a value for the therapeutic index, okay? So the final uh, uh, topic we're talking today about what is a very recent expression, which is called toxicogenomics, toxicogenomics. In this uh, 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 line of research or science, uh, there are numerous, in last decade, recently, numerous new genome-based technologies have become available that allow for large scale analysis of biological response to external stimuli. And actually this course is talking about the biological response to external stimuli, stimuli like the agents. So traditional scientific approaches, the traditional ones, they, they study the, uh, to, to study the biochemical and molecular effect of toxic substance are focused largely on exam exam examining the biochemical pathways that were connected to observe response. And they identify all this using pathology, histology, blood chemistry, and behavior observation. However, these technologies, there are now technologies that are available to examine the entire universe of biological responses to a toxic substance. And these technologies include genomics, we are talking generally now, genomics, which in a single shot, you can characterize the genome of an organism. Transcriptomics, which you characterize the total message or me expressed in cells and tissue under different conditions, like administration of uh, drugs and see what uh, types of gene are transcribed in a single shot. Proteomics, the same principle, but in this case, you identify the total protein that is expressed upon the drug administration. 
or not expressed as well. Meta, meta genomics from metabolism, it is characterization of these small molecules in a cell of tissue, including the substrate, the products, the cofactor of the enzyme that all uh, integrate in the metabolic process. Other omics approach like lipidomics, which is the same, identify the total lipid profile, uh, increase or decrease upon exposure to uh, a toxin. As well as one of the interesting recently, nutrigenomics and see how food will affect the, uh, uh, our uh, background of the genes. Because each level of this analysis generate a large quantity of data, the collection, organization, and evaluation, and the statistical analysis uh, lead to a, 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 a distinct science is called the bioinformatics. And this has been developed, this bioinformatic, to address this, all this inform, information into a computational and statistical challenge to merge all these data to have a, a clear picture of what is going on. So in the field of the toxicology, now we're talking about toxogenomics, it is used to define the area of research that combine the transcript actually it's transcript, which is the messenger RNA, combine the transcript protein metabolite profiling with the conventional toxicology techniques to investigate the interaction between genes and the environmental stress in disease uh, congestion. To incorporating these new te technologies into toxicology, you need several components uh, such as the following. You need a large database of treatment specific information, such as the analysis uh, from the target tissue or body fluid that arise due to exposure to toxicant. So you need these to have in hand, large database, the responses on a different uh, chemicals, on a different animals, and uh, the magnitude of the response. These are all in computer in a large da database. Then you need as well the genomic database that, that describe the DNA sequence of this animal or this species of interest. Then you need a compute, compute, computer or tools in the computer that extract information from these database pages, uh, database, and as well information from the published paper or articles to identify the interconnected network of critical pathways that is altered by the toxic treatment. Then you need to do a comparison with the traditional toxicology in the binds to ensure that the observed omics that came from the bioinformatics and merging all this information are closely aligned with the toxic related battle uh, physiology that is used to be done in the classical approaches of toxicology. And this, this step in the toxic genomic is called phenotypic anchoring, okay? So again, the phenotypic anchoring, you need to compare the traditional toxicology endpoint to ensure that the observed omic responses that you got from the database and internet are closely aligned with the toxicant related battle. The traditional one is the bathophysiology uh, in the animal due to the treatment of the, to the toxicant to the animal. So, so the patterns, so why we need to do this? Okay, because you can detect a pattern. So the pattern in a change in this transcript or the protein or the metabolite profiles provide a signature for the toxic response that will be great value in something called predictive toxicology. And it is very useful for pharmaceutical development because that's mean if you compare, you can predict if this compound will do an effect or adverse effect on certain animal by comparing. The introduction of omics, this omics technology to toxicity this will contribute to the reduction and the refinement and the replacement of the animals in the toxicity studies, because there is a lot of um, 
communities now demand to reduce the use of animals in research or reduce or 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 reduce the animal to the, to a minimum so in case you, you in this in here in toxic toxicogenomics use the data base which already available in the research and you correlate with the traditional toxicology uh, studies and the responses and you get a prediction model from this model you can predict for a novel compound what is the effect on a certain species okay without doing the experiment so here you can see that the drugs can be affected by the gene through the or the genes can be affected by drugs by interaction as well the disease there is drug disease uh, re relationship as well as the relationship of course between gene and disease and all of this it is a study of uh, comparative you need to know the comparative uh, taxonomics and you need to be aware and dr sot mustale okay is it now clear Can finish with so you need to, to understand in uh, toxicogenomics a comparative um, uh, understanding between the relationship between drugs, uh, genes, and disease, because all these three parameters are interacted together to have a clear picture about toxic toxicogenomics. So here in this figure, we'll summarize the uh, the idea uh, behind uh, toxic uh, toxicogenomics. So you can see here if we start if it start with already you have a mice in hand. You do the traditional uh, toxicology study. You get a histopathology uh, result, and you can see the response of the treatment in this histopathology, whatever the organ used. Then you can do as well clinical chemistry on the blood, you can do weight, physiology, the gross parameters on the mice. And you can as well <clears throat> investigate the absorption, the distribution, the metabolism, the excretion of the compound. So you can see that all these processes are considered to be traditional toxicology, okay? All these are pooled together in a toxicology database. And this, if you remember, this is the first step. First the step needed to, uh, uh, for the toxicogenomics. Now, as well, the second one, as we said, you need to have a complete profile picture about the gene, protein, metabolic ex expression profile for the animal of interest. And this is conveyed into database through the sequence of the DNA. This is pulled in a data another database, which is called omics database. And from omics, you can have a genomic database, you have a proteomic data database, as we said before. This database used for sequence anchoring of molecular expression. So you need to anchor or align this database <clears throat> with the molecular expression, which is actually happening through computational analysis. So now you have a multi-domain, multi-genome knowledge. Of course, the figure shows you are dealing with one animal, one experimental animal. But this, if, if it's have done on different animal, different species from, and all this data comes from li literature, comes from research, comes from papers that is already published. So you combine all this info into a multi-domain, multi-genome knowledge. So you have a big bag now that ha is having two things, two big bags. Uh, one bag having the toxicology database that comes from the traditional toxicology. And, and the other big bag ha have a multi-domain, multi-genome, multi null and a lot of knowledge base. Of course, you need the literature mining. You need to dig in the literature to collect all the info. Then you do the phenotypic anchoring, as I said before. You, align the toxicology database comes from the traditional uh, toxicology to align with the domains that you have. So you can identify genes, protein, functional group pathway, and network. 
Now, after modeling and after doing a lot of process that we are not the expert in that, it needs uh, someone with a, a computer background, uh, someone with a bioinformatic background to do <clears throat> the modeling, you will get, you can, in this case, you can, you can have a system that can predict for, for a novel compound, what it is, what, what is its response on a certain tissue in a certain experimental animal. Okay, and this uh, concludes our uh, second uh, lecture. Okay, I'm waiting for your questions. <clears throat>